So, um, hello everyone and welcome to the HTD uh, Centenary uh, Seminar on the 23rd of June 2022. Um, I'm delighted to be chairing this evening because Thank it's all about um, the things that are, I think are really the strength of infectious diseases doctors which is about working together. So I'm going to start by telling you a little story uh, which was uh, a Friday the 13th story. Um, so um, I was working late after a busy um, block on the wards and um, I was uh, down in our offices and I thought I'd just share with uh, Tommy Rampling who was also working late on that Friday night the story of a couple of slightly unusual uh, rashes that we'd had in uh, people who hadn't travelled and uh, you can guess uh, where we went from there but needless to say uh, it'll be seven weeks tomorrow and it's been uh, some of the busiest but also most collaborative um, working I've had in uh, my career so um, it's been really brilliant and a real sign of what we can do when we're stronger together. Um, so we're going to start this evening with uh, Tommy Rampling and Kat Houlihan, who are our uh, co-appointments who work um, both between UKHSA and HTD and UCLH. So Tommy working predominantly at UCLH within the uh, vaccine trial um, team, but also within outpatients at the um, uh, HTD, so supporting the walk-in clinic and uh, doing lots of um, fun data uh, science around that and then Kat uh, who is uh, also 50% virology at UCLH. So um, Kat and Tommy are going to take you through um, well the last seven weeks and um, beyond. Great thanks Sarah I'm just gonna share my screen. So, um, so hopefully that's that's working. Hopefully someone will let me know if my screen hasn't shared. Um, so yeah, thanks Sarah for the introduction. So um, the theme of this talk is essentially about um, about the partnership working and the, and the relationship between the HTD and the imported fever service. And then we're going to talk through uh, essentially the the monkeypox response. So Kat and I will talk through the monkeypox response from the, uh, the the UK HSA side, or at least our involvement in it from the UK HSA side. And then we'll be handing over to um, to Claire Worrell and uh, Emily Emily Shaw, who are going to talk through the some of the the UCLH. Uh, HD and HTD response. Um, so I'm going to give a, a bit of an outline of the imported fever service um, uh, and and what its role is, and then we're going to talk about about monkeypox and and um, uh, at the rare and imported pathogens laboratory, uh, the clinicians uh, there, so myself, Kat, and uh, Claire Gordon have been um, have been running what's called the clinical cell uh, for the monkeypox response and that um, our, our role within that is essentially to produce the the clinical guidance uh, for the monkeypox incidents um, and and also deal with with lots of clinical queries that come through to us either direct sort of queries by individual patients or sometimes about particular scenarios such as infection control issues. Uh, so the imported fever service, um, as it says on the screen here, is a clinical advisory and, a, uh, and it's linked with a diagnostic service because at the rare and imported pathogens laboratory, we also do the diagnostics for lots of imported fever diseases. And it was an, in, an initiative that was uh, started in or has, was active uh, as of June 2012 as a partnership between uh, UK HSA and the Hospital for Tropical Diseases and also uh, colleagues in Liverpool. Um, and the, the idea is, is to provide a, a service for um, hospital based infection uh, clinicians predominantly so infectious diseases or microbiologists um, uh, to to call us after they've um, after they've assessed the patient locally and uh, work out what the, uh, the what the next steps are in terms of, of, of diagnostic investigations and you know the, the the great thing about working at ripple is we have access to a whole suite of, of tests for for um, uh, 
exotic diseases, so not just the, um, the, the viral hemorrhagic fevers and other sort of high consequence infectious diseases, but also a, a, a wide range and it's, it's a regularly expanding range uh, due to uh, the emergence of different pathogens of, of both bacterial and, and viral tests. And you can see I've sneaked a couple of parasites in at the bottom, not because we test them at, at Ripple, but because you know, our close working relationship with the Hospital for Tropical Diseases and the Parasitology Lab there means that we can, you know, through discussion, coordinate uh, testing of, of uh, you know, potential imported uh, uh, parasites as well. And it's designed to be a, a well, it's a 24-7 service. It's staffed by one of the uh, the Ripple consultants 24-7 uh, with backup um, from either the HDD or, or Liverpool. Um, and, um, and we give clinical advice um, and also sometimes infection control advice and help uh, help with, with working through differential diagnoses and, and uh, deciding whether or not uh, things like VHF testing are appropriate. And then, you know, if we do, we can help coordinate that testing, things like, you know, booking couriers and, you know, what um what what type of packaging they need we can we can advise with that and then the close link with our our laboratory means that we can arrange for rapid turnaround of testing if necessary so vhf testing overnight does happen um if if there's a clinical urgency um and also next working day resulting for for things like dengue and other what we would call more regular um uh, imported pathogens and then helping work through with the teams uh, how to interpret the results when, when they come through and um, so this shows the call volume that we would normally expect in the imported fever service. So um, uh, over the last several years, so usually between 15 to 30 odd calls per week. And this is to the imported fever service number. We do also get calls that come through uh, the normal ripple uh, routes through our admin team and pass through to us during the normal working day. But this is mostly the calls that come directly to the imported fever service. So we'll include all of the out of hours stuff. And uh, as you can see, uh, there's a, there was a spike in, in late 2014, uh, uh, which was due um, to the, uh, the uh, Ebola situation in West Africa, and then a, another big spike in, in 2016 uh, uh, due, to, due to the uh, Zika um, situation at the time. And so what have we been doing in, in 2022? Well, um, uh, things were actually reasonably, uh, reasonably um, quiet for the imported fever service uh, because of COVID and the, the, the travel restrictions, we were getting fewer uh, calls than we would usually expect in the imported fever service. But since February 2022, things have been a little bit busy. So we, we, we started with a, a, a Lassa fever um, uh, situation in, in February uh, 2022. So this was a fam family cluster of uh, Lassa fever cases uh, with the in initial case imported from West Africa and then um, and then um, you know, onward transmission, uh, resulting in three cases and sadly one death, um, which um, which resulted in a, a, a huge uh, public health response on uh, account of the fact that there were um, hundreds um, of, of contacts, hospital um, uh, well, healthcare worker contacts predominantly identified uh, requiring uh, requiring follow up. And then uh, one month later in, in March, um, uh, there was a patient who tested positive for Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever following return from uh, Central Asia, which kept us busy for a few weeks. Uh, and then we, we had a brief, um, uh, well, we're, we're still doing it, but we've been uh, working on the paediatric hepatitis outbreak as well. Uh, but then monkeypox um, came along in, in, uh, in early May, um, which uh, we've been working um, uh, we've been working on since then and as I said uh, Ripple are, are running what's called the clinical cell for the monkeypox response. So to talk through the process and the, the IFS involvement in that, um, the first case was, was um, well it was announced on the 7th of May but this was a patient who'd returned from Nigeria um, uh, who developed symptoms on the like, late April, uh, flown back to the UK and presented to hospital fairly promptly. Luckily the um, uh, the, the microbiology doctor on call uh, recognised the potential risk for monkeypox and called us at the imported fever service. Um, we just we talked through the case and agreed that monkeypox testing was indicated, had a result the next day um, and, and the patient was subsequently transferred to a high consequence infectious diseases uh, centre. That was then followed one week later, we got a, um, a, a phone call from uh, a colleague at uh, another um, high consequence infectious diseases centre um, to talk us through a, a, a cluster of cases that they were concerned about, uh, which was a, a, a family cluster um, with uh, two cases who were currently symptomatic and one case who's had similar symptoms but had then resolved. Um, and uh, following discussion and agreement to, to proceed with testing locally for alternative diagnoses, we agreed um, that although the likelihood was very low, given there was no um, 
there were there was no epidemiological uh, risk factors at that time. Uh, we agreed to test for for, for monkeypox, uh, and it came back positive. And it was following the announcement of the uh, of of this household cluster that we then got um, contacts from from other colleagues, including including Sarah, as she mentioned at the start, and some other colleagues at, at other hospitals to notify us of of uh, four uh, suspect well four uh, patients all within the GBMSM uh, community uh, with rashes that as yet um, they'd been unable to, to identify a diagnosis. And so we arranged for uh, those samples to be sent to us uh, over that weekend and all four of those tested positive. And it was then that we knew that something really unusual was, was, was happening. Um, and really up until that point, um, the UK of experience, experience of, of monkeypox was limited to seven cases, four of which were, were separate importations, the first of which in 2018, and then three subsequent onward uh, acquisitions, um, one in a healthcare worker and two uh, household contacts. Um, I'm not going to go through the, the treatment actually because Kat's going to talk briefly about that later on. Um, and, and just just to highlight, because um, I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar now with 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 monkeypox and and what it is, but it's it's an orthopox virus. So in the same sort of family of, of viruses as smallpox and uh, and cowpox, uh, there's a lot of uh, controversy currently around the the name monkeypox, both of the the actual um, uh, name of the virus, but also the the the, the clades. And um, a revision of that is currently being being reviewed, as I understand. Um, but uh, in, it called monkeypox because it was initially identified from from macaques in laboratories. Uh, it's got quite a wide uh, uh, host range, um, uh, predominantly in rodents, but uh, other animals can can be infected. Um, and uh, the 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 cases uh, to date really have been uh, mainly linked to um, West Africa, with N Nigeria being a, a, a large centre for outbreaks, um, and and also Central Africa. But there have been um, there have been outbreaks again with onward transmission, both in the US and and in the UK. And it's uh, usually uh, thought to occur through in humans through contact with infected animals, um, but also you know human to human uh, transmission is known to to occur. Um, usually through, thought to be through direct contact with infected skin lesions or scabs, um, uh, but there, there, there is uh, thought to be a risk through uh, respiratory transmission if, if, uh, if a patient coughs or sneezes uh, and they've got uh, monkeypox isolated from their upper respiratory tract. And the other um, route of transmission uh, is through fomites and materials contaminated with the virus, uh, particularly um, well, well, uh, pox viruses can survive very well in the environment. Um, and and often uh, contaminated uh, linen or clothing, for example, is thought to be a, a particular risk factor uh, when dried uh, skin uh, material uh, is is aerosolized when people are doing laundry or or, or 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 similar such activities. And the virus can enter through broken skin, um, and sometimes even if the skin is not known to be visible, uh, and then also through mucous membranes. Um, but you know, recently the focus has been on whether or not uh, monkeypox can be transmitted through sexual contact, because a lot of the links between uh, contact seem to be uh, seem to be sexual contact, and there are increasing reports coming out that seem to um, that seem to corroborate this. Uh, uh, the, the 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 pictures are from a, a case report uh, of one of the the first four cases in the GBMSM community, um, uh, as uh, as I mentioned previously, um, and um, the. The, the the contact between the the individuals in that paper uh, was 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 sexual contact, but also the the uh, location of the lesion seemed to very much um, uh, corroborate with um, with the points of sexual contact as well. So the situation as of Tuesday um, is that you know, we're, we're currently looking at, at um, 793 cases in the UK with 766 of them in England. Uh, the majority of those are in London and uh, although it says 498, they're actually the, the majority of the ones that are labelled as under investigation have been identified um, in London hospitals. It's just the patient's uh, home residence which is under investigation. Uh, and the, the age sex pyramid um, uh, on the screen is, is is quite remarkable. As you can see, uh, there are ex extremely few uh, uh, female cases. This is almost uh, almost entirely um, uh, male, uh, with um, uh, with a predominance in the uh, 20 to, to 50 uh, age group. 
Um, and um, there's been lots of work going on in UK HSA to identify the epidemiological uh, links uh, and questionnaire based based surveys. Um, and um, there was a recent uh, publication in our technical briefings of um, uh, sexual health um, re-interviews um, of of a, a, a select well uh, of of a number of um, patients, most well all of whom were men, most of whom identified as being gay or bisexual. Um, and um, what was very notable is is a very high percentage uh, reported sex during the incubation period uh, preceding their illness. And uh, there was also a um, uh, there were also findings that suggested that monkeypox was being transmitted in a in geographically diffuse uh, sex sexual networks, which um, will make the the traditional contact tracing as a primary control intervention uh, challenging. But the 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 um, it does also identify potential opportunities for outbreak control um, by engaging with sexual health services as potential settings for delivering. Uh, opportunistic interve interventions such as vaccines, uh, collaborating with sex on premises venues and potentially usage of things like um, uh, geospatial dating uh, applications for things like disseminating public health uh, promotion messages or supporting innovative uh, contact tracing um, uh, initiatives. So um, one of the key things that um, uh, has come out from UKHSA is the publication of this high level principles um, document uh, at the end of May. And this was essentially a proposal to ensure a, a proportionate response so that we can deliver uh, achievable strategic outcomes. And the strategic aims of this uh, were to suppress the transmission and aim for eradication um, uh, through public health measures um, to the highest risk for transmission. Uh, to present to protect against spread of infection in hospitals and healthcare settings and protecting healthcare workers, but also to enable safe functioning of, of NHS services, um, uh, including you know, at the diagnostic um, and case management front end. So that um, essentially had to had to lead to some more proportionate um, uh, responses, um, given that the monkeypox um, up until well, it's it's still managed as a high consequence infectious disease, but that that carries with it uh, a number of, of of implications. But the publication of this this document um, uh, essentially allowed for the home isolation of clinically well patients uh, and patients who um, didn't have vulnerable uh, home contacts, and it also um, uh, specified some slightly some changes to the the minimum PPE particularly uh, for the assessment of possible or probable cases um, to allow for a, a more pragmatic approach in in particular settings um, I'm not going to run through the case definitions they are um, they are available on online but um, essentially what we really wanted to do by trying to um, by by coming up with these case definitions is to come up with with really quite a broad case definition and the important thing about this is the is the possible case definition which really allows for clinician discretion so any clinician who sees a patient and they are worried that they might have monkeypox can access a test uh, and it's important to note they don't have to call ripple to um, to arrange for that test we do want to uh, pay up as many cases as possible so we wanted to make sure that that was as wide as possible. So diagnosis um, currently still uh, in England um, the diagnosis the diagnostics is all currently done um, at, at Ripple uh, but you know, there's, there's a lot of work going on to try and um, uh, facilitate uh, this setup of, of local uh, assays. So it's all done by PCR. Ripple has a, an in-house assay which is based on a previously published method um, and uh, it well, up until this week, it was a two-stage process. So we do a pan-orthopox PCR, and then we do a confirmatory monkeypox-specific PCR, which can tell us which clade the virus is, is as well. But actually, as of this week, we've started running them in parallel. Um, so we, we get the results of both at the same time. And further down the line, we may switch to just doing the monkeypox-specific PCR, but currently we do both. We recommend a single viral swab uh, in viral transport medium uh, from an open sore or from the surface of a vesicle. Um, and um, if uh, there is a patient who doesn't currently have a rash, but they're a high risk contact of a confirmed case and they are symptomatic uh, with other symptoms, then we would recommend sending a throat swab. But clearly, if that's negative, we wouldn't recommend, uh, we would recommend continuing to monitor and isolate those patients and reassess if further symptoms develop. Um, so previously, HCID testing at Ripple always required uh, discussion with an IFS consultant, but um, uh, this was creating an, a, a huge amount of work um, in terms of discussing all of the cases. And actually, we found that often we were discussing with our peers, uh, infectious diseases consultants around the country. Um, and so we, we did change the guidance um, so that the that um, 
testing should first be discussed with a local infection doctor, but we, we uh, remain open for discussion of cases that don't clearly fit the case definition. Um, we have established a monkeypox clinical helpline, which has got a very high call volume. Um, so this is just to show what was happening to our, 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 this was what the IFS calls that we were getting throughout 2022. And as you can see, week 20, I think is around about the uh, 14th or 15th of May. Um, and uh, our call volume really went uh, through the roof. But as of uh, week 21, we set up the um, monkeypox clinical helpline and the calls continue to get um, uh, extremely um, frequent, but uh, thankfully over the last couple of weeks have started to tail off a bit. I think as local sites are becoming empowered to make their own decisions about testing. And the future uh, prospects of diagnostics is the setup of regional and local laboratory capac capacity. Um, there are commercial assays that are being um, uh, evaluated, but there are none that are regularly available currently, but this will uh, very much help with the setup of, of local laboratory capacity. There are some point of care tests that are currently um, uh, in development. Uh, Kefid had a paper in 2017 about a monkeypox um, uh, point of care test. There are also lateral flow tests, which we're planning on evaluating some of at Ripple, um, and uh, we've also got a serology assay, which is currently in the um, in the late stages of evaluation. And then the, the final thing I'll talk about is about semen testing. So we've had a lot of queries about semen testing with the talk about sexual transmission of monkeypox. Um, one of the hot topics is, is what about the persistence of, of, of monkeypox virus in semen? So persistence of viruses in semen is a recognized phenomenon for many diseases, um, but it's completely unknown really to what extent it occurs in, in monkeypox. Uh, and even if we were to find it in semen, what kind of a role would it have in transmission? Because um, you know, a lot of the patients are presenting with anogenital lesions. Um, and is it just um, uh, contact with in, in infectious lesions rather than actual uh, viable virus in, in, um, in semen, for example? Now, there has been a report um, uh, recently uh, from Italian colleagues about um, where they tested three patients' um, uh, semen. Uh, all three tested positive uh, at, at time points closest to the, the symptom onset, um, with CT values ranging um, from 27 to 31. Um, our current guidance in the UK is to use condoms for a minimum of eight weeks after recovery. Um, uh, it, there, there is some discussion ongoing because um, uh, WHO and CDC uh, rec currently recommend 12 weeks, but essentially this is an evidence-free zone currently, and we're trying to recommend what we feel to be both safe but also um, something that people can comply with. Um, but um, we've got a semen assay which is currently um, under the final stages of, of evaluation. We've also got a clinical protocol, and the aim would be at the end of um, uh, the 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 period of, of using condoms um, to hopefully be able to offer uh, semen testing to those who want it, um, both to help with um, uh, safe uh, sexual practices, but also with the opportunities to fill the knowledge gaps. So I'm going to stop there and I'm going to hand over to Kat, who's going to take over and talk us through a number of different aspects. Thanks, Tommy. I'll do another rapid run through in the same way you did. Um, so you can, and I'm going to in the style of Chris Whitty, next slide, please, all the way through this, unfortunately. So briefly wanted to touch on the uh, clinical presentation. And I think what we learned through this outbreak is that most patients, even if presenting initially with a rash, will it, uh, with a fever, will at some point have a rash. And these are our seven cases published recently from the previous seven that we had in the UK before we had um, several hundred. So uh, these are nice illustrations, um, I think, of basically the, the vesicle stages in the top row at the two ends, vesicular and pustular lesions of the palmar uh, macular lesions, some subungal lesions and um, at the bottom right there, just a large abscess. And that's actually something similar that we're um, hearing about from cases and seeing or hearing about more and more publications which are going to come out about cases. So um, our colleague Geraldine O'Hara from Guys and Tommies has highlighted to us two pharyngeal manifestations with a severe tonsillitis and a quincy. Um, and we've also heard about severe genital edema causing obstruction of urethral um, vesicles, causing obstruction um, and, and cases of severe rectal bleeding. So lots of really interesting presentations, um, but predominantly we are seeing that uh, a rash will appear eventually. Um, and that's, uh, that's very useful in terms of whenever we're triaging. So Tommy, you can skip over to the next one. Um, this is related to what um, I think our colleagues are going to talk about in terms of 
uh, risk stratification and uh, protection of the, the public. Um, but just to give you the background on it, uh, this disease, because it's an HSID, was managed as an HSID where patients had to be isolated and there was no negotiation on that until there was a recognition that this is not a severe disease and that there was community transmission at rates which were out of keeping with what the NHS could cope with in terms of isolation. Um, and so very quickly we stepped down to um, patient level assessment to make these three groupings, which I'm sure many clinicians are now very familiar with. <clears throat> but group A um, would be patients who have to be managed in one of the HSIDs, and these are the severely unwell patients with, wide, with either um, widely disseminated lesions, corneal lesions, for example, um, severe pain or complications that I've mentioned, and they should predominantly um, be managed in, in HSID centres. The group B patients are those who still manage, still require management inside a hospital, but these can be managed in the specialist regional ID centres, of which there are now 17 about the country. So, um, and UCLH is one of them, this sort of um, empowerment of these units to become uh, centres that can manage the isolation of these patients. And these would be um, patients who can't isolate at home without um, uh, endangering uh, their, their housemates, such as immunocompromised pregnant or children. But looking forward to hearing a lot more about UCLH's experience with those. And Group C would be the patients who, can, who are neither A nor B, but can be managed safely at home. And that's a, a significant change to policy that, that really opens up um, availability of, of NHS uh, sort of care of these patients, but takes a huge burden onto the health protection teams and to the clinical teams who then run virtual wards. Um, Tommy, if you skip on to the next one, this is a set of uh, slides about the de-isolation guidance, which Tommy and I sweated blood over when, when we needed to get patients out into uh, out of hospital and not in the same way that they were being de-isolated previously, which was that they had to have multiple negative samples. So we divided this up and you can keep flicking through them, Tommy, initially um, to get out for isolation from a facility. So this would be to step down from a, an isolation bed into a different part of the hospital. You need to be considered safe. And so we made these three criteria of clinical, laboratory and uh, lesion based criteria. And the laboratory criteria are that PC, your PCR negative in all samples that you were previously PCR positive in, particularly in urine and throat swabs. Um, so if you go into the next one, to get out of hospital and to go home for full de-isolation, clarifying that full de-isolation is basically freedom, um, you still need to reach all these negative criteria. So that's going straight from isolation to home, which is the way we used to do it. Um, and that's, uh, that's uh, negative in all those criteria. The next one is discharge from hospital to isolation at home. And that's a clinical judgment, as always, it should be with the NHS. And then when you're at home, there are two different um, isolations. One is um, self-isolation when you're when you're at home and you're not going out and you can end that self-isolation to go into a step down kind of isolation. Once you meet the cl clinical criteria, but you've got no lesions which are visible and can't be covered and you've got no oral lesions because we as we understand um, what we're learning all about now is that when we talk, we actually do spray some of our saliva and containing viruses when there's viral lesions in the mouth um, at our friends and colleagues. So the, there should be no visible lesions which can't be covered, there should be no oral muc mucous membranes lesions and the patient should be afebrile. And then full de-isolation, meaning freedom, which is that you can return to your work as a healthcare worker with immunocompromised people, for example, completely normal resolution of life um, would be the clinical criteria plus no new lesions for 48 hours and none of the mucous membrane lesions. The skin is intact and the skin remains uh, completely intact underneath the lesion because we know that these crusted lesions contain variants and can be aerosolized. Um, next one, Tommy. So yeah, and you can flip through this. So this is just briefly to touch on the treatments because these are really important, basically to highlight that we have very little evidence and, and what we're being involved in in terms of generating or supporting the generation of some of that evidence. So sodofovir is this mono, uh, monophosphate nucleotide analogue which um, incorporates into the DNA expanding chain in the place of cytidine and prevents DNA polymerase from expanding that chain. We all know it's got terrible nephrotoxicity. That's its main problem. Brinsidofovir, and so this is a chemical image of it. Brinsidofovir is the same, but with a lipid tail. It's the only difference, and it's set, so therefore has an intracellular metabolism, which gets around the nephrotoxicity, but has a problem with its um, transaminases. 
So in the seven in the cases, the seven cases I presented, those who were given brinzidofovir had to stop it because of transaminitis. It's also very difficult to get hold of at the moment. The last one um, is vaccinate immunoglobulin. I just mentioned this because it still pops up in lots of guidance of what you can use as treatment. This is not really moving forward into any treatment trials. It was used a lot in the 50s, 60s, up until vaccines stopped as a post-exposure treatment for people that were accidentally given the, the live vaccine when they were immunocompromised. Uh, we're not moving forward with that one for any treatment trials. What we are using is tecaviramat, um, and probably this really interesting paper, I think has been discussed in journal clubs, uh, probably at UCLH in virology and beyond. If you go into the next slide, Tommy, you'll see that tecaviramat has this mechanism of action, which is to do with the, um, the uh, VP37 protein, which interacts with host proteins in order to take the virus from its final stages into um, enveloping an egress of the virus. It's licensed. It's got a great safety profile. You can flick through all of these small points, sorry, and it's a, a nice oral presentation. Um, this little graph at the bottom is the one case that we gave it to uh, in our seven, that it was given to in our seven case series. And this patient managed to, unlike all the other patients, um, have resolution of their blood and upper respiratory tract, DNA positivity within 48 hours and within um, seven days was home. And this is a much shorter duration of illness. They were home at day seven compared to the up to sort of 30 days. Now, this was not a randomized control trial. It was not um, given to the patient for any reason other than to reduce their hospital stay and reduce their infectiousness. So there is a desperate need for a randomized control trial. And when I talk about the research that UKHSA are involved in, and particularly Tommy's involved in, um, that's one important part of it and which we're really, really excited about. Um, to touch on the vaccines, because I think um, UKHSA are obviously heavily involved in this and um, and it's important to, to sort of mention, ACAM 2000 is the second generation smallpox vaccine, which probably has, which she definitely has efficacy against monkeypox. Um, it's used up until 1971, so everybody born up until that point probably has some zero positivity and that's very relevant for something I'll mention at the end in terms of um, research. But it was administered with this birificated needle um, and caused multitude of um, problems, especially in immunocompromised people, but possibly also in those with eczema. Um, and this is why the immunoglobulin was occasionally used. And we now have this brilliant and lots of people on the call will actually have had this modified vaccinia Ankara virus. So this is still vaccinia virus. It's been passaged in chick embryo fibroblasts so many times it's 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 incompetent at replication and it's lost its virulence factors. So this is now a, a really safe vaccine, few adverse events, theoretically safe in pregnancy. And is one that in the UK is now planned to be rolled out um, into high risk GBMSM populations in order to work like a pre-exposure prophylaxis. And so I think that that announcement in the press a couple of days ago has caused um, a barrage of um, requests for the vaccine. Uh, the UK has administered 800 doses of vaccine across the country so far, has ordered just less than 30,000 doses of vaccine and, and should continue to um, to order more. I think it's just Bavaria Nordic um, being unable to keep up with supply and demand at the moment. Finally, next one, Tommy, if we talk a little bit about um, monkeypox genomics, I don't know if I have to let that person in. Um, so uh, just thinking about this virus, it's huge. It's uh, 197,000 base pairs long. It's got uh, a mutation rate of one to two SNPs per year. So when we have seen the current mutation rate of 48 SNPs in the four or five, in the five cases that uh, that UK HSA has uh, run whole genome sequencing on, that's an incredible rate of mutation when you compare to the 2018 strain. 21 of these um, mutations affect proteins. And so these are theoretical, obviously there needs to be far more um, far more studies, but these theoretical changes are classified as low, medium and high risk um, mutations. And the high risk one causes in, when um, applied to cowpox, causes a reduction in, in virulence. What's interesting for me is the medium priority. I don't understand why it's medium priority, but the FL 
F13L actually reduces tecovirumab resistance, and that mutation by one SNP has been found already in, um, in the circulating strains. Um, the graph I've put here is from virologica.org, and it, it's based on sequences from within the UK in 2022 run by UK's HSA, but, but also more international. Another great example of brilliant collaboration globally in terms of genomics. Um, but what's really interesting, and this is data produced by um, Anya O'Toole and Andy Rambo from Edinburgh, is it there's a possible influence of an Apobec 3 mutation of an Apobec 3 human gene on the mutations that are happening in that genome, suggesting it's been uh, circulating in humans for um, more for longer than one might expect. There's more there's more mutations than there should be in that um, in that set of sequences. And today, a really interesting release of data um, from the CVR just talking about uh, co-infection of different virions within an individual patient. Fascinating stuff in genomics and uh, more, much more to follow. And then last one, I just wanted to talk about planned research. So a horrible list of loads of blue sky thinking ideas and things that we don't know that we wish we did know. If you go to the next one, Tommy, you'll see what I've put in red, which is what Ripple are involved in in terms of research. Um, so this level of undiagnosed disease and trends and growth, we're helping out with a seroprevalence study, looking back at when, when monkeypox was first circulating in the UK, with brilliant um, sharing of uh, samples, potentially from CNWL colleagues from UCLH and from beyond. Um, the correlation between CT and disease, um, we've just got a HIS grant to look at um, the seven previous patients and look at whether their CT values indicate infectiousness. Really excited to get started with that. Therapeutics, I mentioned Tommy from UK, HSA is leading on the R side of the, the therapeutics trial, the NIHR funded RCT. And then finally, we're looking at rolling out some uh, rapid diagnostic tests. We're just going through ethics to, to see what we can do in terms of um, local testing. Great. Last slide, I think. So just to summarise, um, I'm sorry, I would probably have run over, but um, it's been a brilliant collaboration with HTD and I think um, this collaboration has led, as Sarah alluded to at the very beginning, to this. So the UK are ahead of the game and we, we don't have a worse monkeypox outbreak than other countries. We're actually our rate of growth is right in the middle of all the other countries. We just found it first and that's why we have the most cases. And we found it first because we all talked to each other and we picked it up and we tested people that we wouldn't normally test. And that's, I think, credit to the to the brilliant network that we've that we've developed and we've got. Um, Tommy and I had a chance to moan about 2022. We didn't sign up for a job as busy as this. Um, that's just that's just been it's been a real adventure and it's been great and it's been great having the support of HTD for for the adventure that we've been on. And then monkeypox, we've just summarised and um, the benefits of the link the the UK HSA and our and our role in the in the response. And then finally, we've got loads of people to thank. Um, and this is an, a non-exclusive list. Um, what we did want to say, Tommy and I, I think, is that we wanted to say thanks to our uh, NHS um, teams. So I, I'm grateful to virology for allowing me to do a 50-50 job and sometimes not do as much virology as I should so I can do HTD, uh, so I can do UK HSA much more. And for Mike, uh, for originally allowing this sort of job share um, thing that we've set up. But thanks very much and sorry for running over. So, so coming, coming to, to coming to, to um, uh, back to me because I forgot to tell you lots of things. But Claire and I mean Kat and Tommy, what a fantastically clear and um, uh, trip through what has been an incredible uh, 2022 for you guys and. We are um, incredibly lucky to be working with you both. So um, fantastic. Thank you so much. We'll take questions uh, from the Q&A. So do put, put them in there if you wish to. Um, and I'm going to hand over to two of the most fabulous um, final year, um, Perry and indeed post CCT for Emily uh, trainees. So Dr. Emily Shaw and Dr. Claire Worrell, um, you'll have probably come across both of 
of them, um, but certainly Claire, because she um, was the fever service reg uh, quite recently, and uh, they are going to talk about our uh, experience of monkeypox HTD with data that is completely hot off the press. I could see Claire, well, in fact, Emily putting things together with Excels and little tally charts uh, all of about two hours ago, and she's raced home and got home in, in time for the tube strike. So um, over to Claire. Many thanks indeed. Yes, so Emily and I have been involved in developing and delivering the HDD monkeypox virtual ward as the outbreak has evolved. And I'm going to give a very brief overview of the service and Emily the stats in this talk. So in mid-May, um, as soon as the realisation that uh, widespread community transmission was occurring and alerts had been sent to clinical networks and the media was picking up on this, uh, we began to see increasing numbers of patients fitting the criteria for testing on arriving um, at our emergency department in referrals from GPs and sexual health clinics. Um, so uh, this obviously is a containment level three pathogen and in the real world it is high maintenance. So the specific resources uh, required, you know, it's heavy in PPE, sample preparation requirements, and also the, 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 the querying, the getting these samples to the right places. So with close collaboration with our local virologists, the emergency department, um, the rare imported pathogen team lab, um, we rapidly developed and streamlined a uh, testing and management pathway that would work within our, uh, our unit, as uh, many ID services, I'm afraid, had to uh, in the last few weeks. Um, and, but it soon became apparent that very few patients were actually clinically or socially uh, requiring admission uh, with suspected or confirmed monkeypox. And a majority were understandably very anxious, but relatively well. Um, and there was no pre-existing virtual ward model for this virus. Um, so we developed an in-house system that we hoped would work and went with it. Um, so we tested patients, sent them home if they met the uh, the, the criteria for that. Um, and we followed them up with a phone call at 48 hours because initially uh, it took around three to four days to get the results um, from Ripple. Once we got the results, we, um, uh, we if it's negative, we re-evaluate what's going on. So have they had any evolution of the symptoms? Have they had any new confirmed contacts uh, with monkeypox? Um, and was there an alternative differential diagnosis that was uh, was likely or was our pretest probability pretty high? Um, so if it was yes to any of these, then we did in a few cases um, um, retest them and continue to isolate, um, but the majority we managed to discharge. If the result was positive, we used um, the beautifully described by CAT risk assessment developed by the UKHSA. Um, and if it was a group A or B uh, patient, they obviously needed to be admitted to hospital. Um, but if it was a group C patient, um, then uh, they came into our virtual ward. And initially we were following them up every 48 hours. But as the clinical demand has increased, we have reduced the frequency of, um, of, of following them up. And in each review, we ask about symptoms, we ask them to send us photographic um, uh, evidence of, of how the lesions are evolving um, and this helps with uh, de-isolation decisions. We ask about their mood, about the psychology. We use the Nigerian CDC guidelines to develop this pathway and this came across as an incredibly important factor, perhaps, well, much more so than actually the clinical uh, complications, which are quite rare of this very mild disease. Um, and also we reappraised their isolation circumstances. Was there a reason they would need to actually come into hospital? Um, was it going uh, OK? And if they met the de-isolation criteria, then of course we discharged them from the ward. We developed a number of resources um, as adjuncts to this. Um, and, um, and these included um, uh, documents where even doctors or clinicians who had very little by way of experience in discussing monkeypox cases uh, could uh, cover the relevant information required to ensure that they were in the appropriate groupings, but also if they needed additional support or indeed if they could be de-isolated. And um, a huge amount of the support of these patients was giving consistent UKHSA level advice. Um, there was a lot of information uh, changing 
changing information coming from the authorities about isolation requirements, how you do your laundry. Um, so we gave um, sort of almost scripted things for uh, for clinicians to cover when they were discussing uh, with patients and to meet the, the, the ideas, concerns and expectations of the patients. And as I've already alluded to, um, we, we use the Nigerian guidance very heavily to govern this pathway. Um, so, um, so overall, um, it's, it seems to be working very well and Emily's about to present uh, the data from it. Um, and we've been very fortunate um, that uh, having uh, shared some of the elements of our pathway um, with wider NHS bodies. And you may well have seen that the virtual uh, management of confirmed monkeypox cases document was published two days ago. Um, and, um, and we were very fortunate to contribute some elements of our pathway um, to this. And we hope very much it, it, it helps clinicians who are setting up their own services along this line. So over to you, Emily. Thank you, Claire. And I'll just, can I just check that my microphone is, I've, I had to literally run from the train, so I didn't have time to do an AV check. So can everyone hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, so as, uh, as Sarah alluded to, these are hot off the press stats that um, I was gathering up until a couple of hours ago. Um, so I'm going to show you some data that we've collected from our virtual ward. And I'm going to show you the data for the first 74 patients which we enrolled between the sort of initiation of the virtual ward on the 14th of May uh, up until the 13th of July. So it's uh, approximately a month. Um, so 74 patients were enrolled onto our virtual ward in that period. Um, subsequently, I think there's been about uh, 30 more positives since then. So um, we're definitely seeing um, a lot of cases. So um, of those 74 patients, um, there were 30 patients who had either walked into our UCLH ED or been referred to us uh, by GPs or had walked into our HDD walk-in clinic. Uh, 30 of those came back positive and um, there were 25 patients who had done the same, so had either walked into ED, been referred by GP or came to our walk-in clinic who we screened who came back negative. Um, so it's uh, just over a sort of 50% hit rate of, of positive when we have assessed a patient and decided that um, they met the criteria and um, should be tested uh, for monkeypox. Also enrolled on our um, virtual ward um, were um, patients who had been screened by the sexual health clinics uh, within the um, Central North and West London uh, Sexual Health Unit and uh, so there were 16 patients who had been tested and come back positive who we enrolled on our ward from CNWL and also three patients uh, referred to us either from Dean Street or Chelsea and Westminster Hospital um, maybe because um, their uh, care was predominantly in our region normally and one patient from King's. Um, so every Everyone uh, who we tested got screened um, for risk factors or should have been screened for risk factors. Um, so of the 50 positive patients uh, that were enrolled on our virtual ward in that month, 41 um, identified as gay, bisexual or MSM uh, and nine of the 50, either uh, the patient chose not to disclose that or um, it was not documented. So every one of our 50 positive patients um, from that month of collection was male um, and no one identified as heterosexual. Um, of those 50 positive patients, uh, 32 um, uh, disclosed that they had had casual sexual partners um, in the three weeks preceding um, so sorry, a, at least a casual or multiple casual sexual partners in the three weeks preceding the onset of any symptoms um, in 18, either this was not disclosed or not documented. Um, and um, uh, of the 50 positive patients, um, eight reported that they had had uh, sexual intercourse with a uh, person who had subsequently um, contacted them to say that they had been confirmed as having monkeypox themselves. Um, of um, the 50 positive patients, um, 20 of them, uh, so 40 percent, had systemic symptoms either preceding the onset of lesions or systemic symptoms uh, that came on at the same time as those lesions. So we asked about fevers, myalgia, um, arthralgia, fatigue, um, headache and also lymphadenopathy. Um, 
but there were 14 uh, of the 50, so 28% who developed their systemic symptoms after they uh, developed the lesions. Uh, there were seven who reported no systemic symptoms at all, um, and in nine patients we uh, didn't have adequate data. Uh, thinking about the presentation of the rash, so 60%, so 30 of the positive patients um, had disseminated lesions that had spread to multiple body parts, um, but in 11 of the patients, the lesion or lesions were localised just to the anogenital uh, area, um, and in two, they uh, only had um, oral and uh, um, facial lesions. In six of the patients, the lesions were um, isolated to anogenital regions and oral facial areas. Um, and in two of our patients, in addition to uh, disseminated lesions, they also had an additional diffuse macular papular sort of uh, sort of typical viremic rash. Um, and in nine of our patients, they reported oral mucosal uh, ulceration. Um, and as Kat alluded to, um, a sort of um, tons sort of inflamed tonsillitis type picture um, is quite common amongst those who report oral um, ulceration. Um, so the aim of our um, virtual ward was to see if we could manage patients safely as outpatients, and that was uh, possible in the vast majority of our patients. So in 38 out of these uh, 50 positive cases, uh, they were managed exclusively as outpatients. So they were assessed uh, and then swabbed either in the ED setting or our walk-in setting or in a sexual health clinic, and then were asked to go home and isolate, and then we were able to manage them exclusively as outpatients patients uh, with regular telephone consults uh, and perhaps only bringing them back to ED for further assessment if required. Um, Twelve of the patients did require admission at some point. Two were because um, that was right at the, the start of um, the epidemic uh, before uh, we had launched the, the virtual ward. Um, and then um, so there were a handful that would have um, been deemed to have a clinical need to admit for admission. So one because they had dysphagia, uh, one patient uh, because they had a reactive arthritis, uh, one who presented actually with uh, diarrhea and vomiting, which was found to be uh, norovirus uh, and also went into urinary retention. Three patients had a uh, complicating cellulitis that required admission for intravenous antibiotics and one patient had an MSSA bacteremia and then three patients were from that um, group B that we alluded to who were either of no fixed abode um, or not able to isolate safely um, because of their housing circumstances so were potentially putting uh, other people at risk. Um, so the challenges of uh, setting up our virtual wards. So uh, we have had a, a very small handful of patients who um, uh, declined uh, to be tested or isolate or have um, disengaged from our services. Um, there is, uh, as Claire mentioned, the, the psychological impact of isolation. Um, ooh, sorry, if we could go back, Claire. Um, uh, and then oh, it's been uh, we've been chasing our tails trying to keep our SOP up to date because as soon as we um, sort of have an SOP approved and release it, um, uh, guidance will change with as as more information comes to light and we have to update it again. So it's it's been a, a rapidly evolving situation, um, and uh, we we've obviously got limited resources that we've had to um, to sort of reorganise. Uh, ourselves to be able to manage um, the, the caseload that we found ourselves with. Next slide. Um, uh, so in conclusion, we found uh, that we've, we've had a very high positivity rate um, of, of PCR testing coming back positive where we've had clinical suspicion. Um, and in our cohort, we've identified uh, that um, we're seeing cases in a very specific community and uh, we ourselves haven't seen any spillover outside uh, of that community as of yet. Um, and that we've found that um, 
we are seeing patients who don't have that classic prodrome uh, of systemic symptoms prior to the lesion onset. And we're also seeing people who just have um, might have one or two localised lesions without the disseminated rash uh, and without systemic symptoms. Uh, we found that the vast majority are systemically very well and we've encountered very few complications and we feel that we can manage them safe in the community and by far and wide. Um, we've had really good engagement from patients um, that they uh, have presented themselves for testing. Uh, they've um, cooperated with everything that we've asked of them and they've really been engaged and taken responsibility uh, for trying to limit onwards transmission. So we found it uh, so far uh, a really successful uh, uh, way to uh, care for our patients. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's been a huge amount of work um, for the last uh, six or so weeks. So just to thank my colleague um, Claire, who uh, worked so hard with me, and then also uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah Logan, Phil Gothard and Michael Marks, um, who have worked with us uh, as consultants to ensure things have run smoothly, um, and all our uh, colleagues in infectious diseases and uh, sexual health and PHE and Porton Down. Um, and the HCID. Thanks very much. Wow, Emily and Claire, I mean, that's really just incredible. You've just presented data to probably around 80 attendees uh, and I hadn't even seen it yet. It's great. Uh, it's lovely data and thank you for um, working so hard. You really have just taken um, uh, and pivoted and run with the service. And as you uh, allude to, you know, it's a way, it's the right way to manage uh, a group of um, patients who we don't as ID doctors look after as much as sexual health providers and I think we've all learned a lot uh, through doing that. So um, there are some questions in the chat about um, the virtual management approach which I think we'll come back to um, but I first I think I might go to Kat on a question about uh, well cats and dogs. Uh, so um, what is the uh, the question comes from Hussein in, in Canada who says I wonder if you could speak about managing the anthroposinotic uh, risk in particular whether the UK is still removing pets from the home when people are isolating and if so whether this approach is viewed to decrease overall risk. So a question on cats and dogs and then I also thought we might ask you to uh, comment about the uh, infection control, waste disposal stuff, if you're happy to do that too. Thanks, Kat. Glamorous, glamorous questions for me. I'll do this very quickly because there's so many questions and there's about four minutes. The uh, guidance is that you isolate away from your pet within the house so that the pet should be cared for by somebody else if possible and if not possible the pet should move out. That's of course um, important but they, they may well have already been infected. It's particularly worrying for rodents who are more susceptible to monkeypox and actually there's a nice, if you want to read a bit more, the um, the Hares group who are the human animal infection risk surveillance group at UKHSA have written a nice um, piece which does involve removing the animals and regularly testing them and we don't think that's actually being followed in general guidance. Um, but yes, definitely staying away from, from pets and animals when infected and infectious is important. And then I can I can direct you more again to the guidance. There are some nice guidance of how people can decontaminate their own homes um, using standard washing machines and standard detergents safely with some really nice, clear, easy to read advice written by UKHSA, which I definitely recommend people who are trying to do this home isolation um, have a look at. Right, so I'm going to move to some virtual management questions because I think that's obviously something people are trying to deal with a lot. So um, perhaps I might go to Emily if that's all right. Um, and the questions, and then maybe one to Claire about analgesia. So um, Claire, if you can take the analgesia question, but first to Emily, um, how many women have you tested? Are you finding that they do, uh, that patients have been compliant with isolation? Um, how many of the patients on the virtual ward have you had to readmit or admit? Um, and, then, yeah, and then I'll go to um, Claire on the um, analgesia. Thanks. Um, Claire, are you able to put one of my slides back up, the last one with the blue graph at the bottom? I don't know if that, is that possible or are we out of that um, mode now? Sorry, no. Um, no, okay, not to worry. Um, 
so the question how many have we had to readmit there was just one gentleman that was readmitted um who was in uh went into urinary retention it wasn't quite clear why because he didn't seem to have um he had in the genital ulcers but didn't have um uh, didn't we didn't think had urethral involvement but he went into urinary retention um and then successfully uh, um had the catheter removed but then went back into urinary retention so um that's been the only patient that's required readmission how many women have we tested sorry i didn't have a chance to show all the data so that didn't include um the negatives um but we haven't um uh off the top of my head, the uh, very few women and the ones we have tested have come back as uh, VZV. So um, they were um, uh, sort of classic presentations of chickenpox um, in adults, but um, early on um, in in the outbreak, we were maybe being a bit more cautious and um, and testing anyone um, <laughs> that that um, had vesicles. Um, and um adherence so uh yeah we've um uh sorry that was on my one of my slides let me see if i can just put it up to remind myself we had um uh disengaged i think it was three patients so out of the 50 positive three patients have disengaged from our services uh where they've come in they've been tested and then we've either not been able to get hold of them again or um they have um, been available to receive the results and then have disengaged from our, our subsequent follow up. So on the whole, extremely good adherence. Um, it's not I don't feel like that's been a major problem. Any, did I miss any other of the other questions? Is that it? Yep. <laughs> Over to Claire. Uh, so three points to answer the pain question. Um, we use um, couriers to send out meds to patients who are isolating. Uh, we hope very much to give them a good supply of analgesia when they're in the emergency department before they leave us on, uh, on the initial screening, um, but sometimes that's not always possible. Um, and we follow the NICE pain control ladder, um, the NICE guidance that, that anyone would use. Obviously, if the pain is not controlled uh, by the maximal levels of that, then we do have to admit them for pain management. Um, and and um, following on from that, uh, some of the, the most symptomatic uh, challenges we've had has been that of oral ulcers, um, preventing people from drinking um, and eating. And Diflam mouthwash has been incredibly successful and is very, very popular uh, with our particular cohort. Um, so that's been very valuable for that particular thing. I hope that answers the question. Wonderful, I think it does, Claire. And I think we should just go for the last comment, really, to Tommy. Um, Tommy, I guess two things, really. Um, how many are ripple testing who are not in the uh, gay, bisexual and men who have sex with men cohort? And then a second question. Is there anything we know at the moment about the correlation with immunocompromise and are they presented with more severe disease? And that'll be our last questions. Yeah, um, so there's going to be slightly frustrating answers to both of those questions because I'm not going to be able to uh, quantify either of those things. However, um, what I can say is that we are um, we, we certainly are testing um, plenty of uh, patients outside of the GB, MSM and travel risk groups. Um, but um, and we're currently analysing that data, which we, we hope we, we will be able to make um, public at some point. But um, but they're just not coming up positive. So um, we we are um, we're getting sent plenty of tests in women, in children, in patients who don't identify as GBMSM, um, but we're just not seeing the positives as yet. But we're we're still very you know it's very important to keep uh, testing these patients um, because we're very aware of the fact that spillover into into broader communities may be maybe a possibility. And then in terms of the uh, uh, immunocompromise, I mean. Um, yeah, interesting question. I mean, certainly it was um, uh, it was being used as an indication for admission uh, early on in the sort of the risk stratification patients who um, had been identified as immunocompromised. Um, you know, there are a reasonable number of patients who uh, are living with HIV um, who have been diagnosed with monkeypox, although most of them have got well controlled disease um, and therefore um, not considered to be uh, immunocompromised. Um, but hopefully that stuff will come out in, in clinical characterization studies which are currently underway. Uh, that was absolutely fantastic. Uh, Tommy, Kat, 
Claire and Emily. I can't thank you enough. You've done a huge amount of work, all of you. I feel very, very, very lucky uh, to work with you all. Um, Tommy, 13th of uh, Friday, the 13th of May will remain in my memory. Um, and thank you so much, everyone, for joining. I hope you found it interesting. Um, the next HTD Centenary Seminar will be on the 28th of July. That's a Thursday. And uh, we're going to keep it a secret what we're talking about. Nothing like doing something that's emerging, eh? So uh, look forward to your joining us then uh, if you can make it. Uh, all the best and thanks very much. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks.